I will tell you honestly, there are some sermons that are not easy to preach, and yet we must. God has charged us to do it. I have no apology for truth, but rather I pray that I might be kind and sympathetic and understand that I didn't always know these things. Beloved, let me say what I told you already. Truth is never sent to hurt you or to offend you. Amen. Truth is sent to enlighten you. And there are always those who are glad to hear the truth. Am I right? Amen. Now there will be conclusive proof of the propositions made tonight. The title of our message is The Truth About a Wonderful Lie. Amongst these many questions that came in that I didn't have time to answer, there are those, and they are serious and they are honest, who are still wondering about the Sabbath change and, and saying what they have been taught that we do it under the new covenant and I'm aware that people are not always here when these truths are covered by scripture the new covenant and we will get back to it tomorrow night is not a change of the law but rather the lifting of the law from tables of stone and the writing of the law on the tables of the heart but it's the same law and that's the new covenant and beloved Pray for understanding. You owe it to yourself whether you want to do God's will or not. Now, I'm going to suggest some things from Scripture. I hope you write them down and read them at home because I've got to go along quickly. But I will say very clearly and distinctly what the texts are, and I would ask you to write them down, please. The truth about a wonderful lie, did God change his Sabbath? If not, who did? Is Sunday the Lord's Day? No. I submit that Sabbath and the Lord's Day are the same thing. The commandment says it is the Sabbath of the Lord. Mark 2, 27 and 28. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, verse 28, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Amen. And I will show you, I hope, an historical document that shows for historical proof that Ignatius was the first one to call Sunday the Lord's Day and Sylvester, Bishop of Rome, officially changed and gave the title to Sunday himself, the Bishop of Rome. Now did God do it? Here are the texts. In Psalms 89 and verse 34, God said, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is going out of my mouth. Alter means change. If you buy a dress or a suit and it doesn't fit, you can have it altered. Which means they change it to fit you. God said, I will not alter the thing that is going out of my mouth. Malachi 3, 6. Write it down. Malachi 3, 6. God said, I am the Lord. I change not. I change not. Ecclesiastes 3, 13 and 14. There the Bible says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. You see, we fall into the human uh, syndrome. Man does things the best he knows and then has to change. God isn't like that. He does it right the first time. It is not necessary for God to change. Bible says in 1st Chronicles 17 27 1st Chronicles 17 27 thou blessest O Lord 
and it shall be blessed forever. Ladies and gentlemen, God made the earth in seven days. On the first day he made light, and then he went on to make the firmament and the sun, the moon and the stars. He peopled the oceans with fishes of all and various kinds. And then he gave on the sixth day of the week, he, he, he created beasts of the field and of the forest. And finally he made man, and then God saw it was all good. Genesis 2, 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had created and made, and God rested, and he blessed it. Are you listening? And the Bible says, Thou blessest, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. So I conclude, on the basis of those six or seven texts, God did not change his Sabbath. Would you say amen? Well, maybe Jesus did. Let's see what the Bible says about him. Let's see what he said about himself. In John 4 and verse 34, Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Doesn't sound like Christ has his separate agenda. In Luke 4, 16, the Bible says, write it down, please. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue or church on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Jesus had a custom of going to church. The dictionary says, going to church on Sabbath. The dictionary says, a Christian is one who does as Jesus did, thinks as Jesus thought, walks as Jesus walked, believed as Jesus believed. A Christian follows Jesus. Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Jesus said, think not. That I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you. That word verily means of a certainty. Without a doubt. Surely, surely. Let me start again. Verily I say unto you. Till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle. Shall in no wise pass from the law. Till all be fulfilled. All of what? Till heaven and earth pass. And then he said, Whosoever therefore shall break one, how many? One. Of these least commandments, the one you consider to be the most inconsequential. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now I want you to look at Jesus as a prophet. Write it down. Matthew 24 and verse 20. Jesus had said that the temple of Jerusalem would be destroyed. It would be a great slaughter amongst the Jews. He was looking 40 years into the future. Are you listening? Christ was a prophet. He was looking down the stream of time nearly 40 years. And Jesus knew that his people would be in danger, same as everybody else, when the Romans came to sack Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, it happened in AD 70. Jesus is looking down the stream of time and he said to those who would believe, pray that your flight, not flying in the air, flight means fleeing. Pray that your flight be not in the winter time, neither on the Sabbath day. Would you say amen out there? Amen. Now anybody who thinks he changed something when he rose from the dead needs to understand that Jesus was looking into the future nearly 40 years. And he said it's going to be awful. And there are certain signs and when you see them, flee. And pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. The compassionate Jesus. It could be hard running in the winter. For he had said if you, if you see these signs, don't even go home to pack your stuff. And that's what the King James Ver Version uses, stuff. A lot of folk are going to hell because of stuff. So Jesus said, don't even go to pack your stuff. Flee! But pray that it won't be in the winter. If you flee any other time, you had gleaners rights. You could stop by other folks' fields and you could assuage your hunger. Then he said, pray that it not be on the Sabbath. He was concerned that his people not Break the Sabbath, even fleeing from Jerusalem. Would you say amen? amen? Forty years into the future, 
and the believers did pray. And I want to tell you as a student of church history, they left on a Wednesday in October. Would somebody say amen? amen. And they fled to Pella. And not a single Christian died in the siege of Jerusalem under General Titus of Rome in AD 70 when the Romans with their broadswords burst into the temple and they slew and hew down uh, indiscriminately the old and the young and the blood of the white marble floors became like crimson rivulets and 97,000 were taken back to Rome for the sport of the Caesars. Not a Christian was amongst them because they heard the word of the Lord and they prepared and they didn't have to leave on the Sabbath and they didn't have to leave in the winter. Jesus said, I'm respecting my Sabbath this far in advance. In Luke 16 and verse 17, Jesus said it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle of the law to fail. Do you believe Jesus told the truth? Then let that sink in. What really does become an enigma to me is how someone can hear the word and look at it in their own Bibles and still hunt for a loophole. There is no loophole. If there were, I'd tell you. As a matter of fact, a bishop of the Roman church once offered a thousand dollars to anybody who could take the Bible and prove that Sunday was a Sabbath. I want to offer more than that. I'd like to start with a million. No, 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 no. Let's make it two million. And I'll give you my brother's car <laughs> and his house. Now, you folk know I don't have any two million dollars. The thing is, you don't need it. If a loophole could have been found other than these little nimby pamby excuses somebody would have come up with it before now it is not there if the bible is your only rule of faith so i don't think god did it and i know jesus didn't do it what about the apostles maybe they did it it might surprise you to know that peter james and john had never heard of sunday keeping they died and went on to their grave. Never heard of it. Amen. You'll see. You, look, you don't have to. In fact, I told you, you don't even have to learn this from me. You can go to a good library and read everything I'm going to tell you tonight. Amen. Amen. Did the apostles do it? Acts 20 and verse 27, Paul said, We have declared unto you all the counsel of God. Now, if all means all, and if God changed the Sabbath, he should have included that. It's not included because it's not a part of all the counsel of God. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 14, write it down. The Bible says they departed from Perga in Antioch and came to Pisidia. And they reasoned on the Sabbath in the church. Verse 42 says, and when the Jews were going out, the Gentiles besought them that they could learn the next Sabbath. Verse 44, the whole city came together. Why did I go through all of that because there's some who say the only reason they went to church was to meet with the Jews. Well, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And when he went to preach, it was for whosoever will. And the Bible says the next Sabbath, not Sunday, next Sabbath came the whole city, Jews and Greeks, to hear the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 18 and verse 4. He reasoned with them every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Acts 17 and 2, Paul, as his manner was. Now, we already read that Jesus, as his custom was, went to church on the Sabbath. Now we read that Paul, as his manner was, went to church and for three Sabbath days taught the people. That's Acts 17, 2. No, God didn't do it. Christ didn't do it. The disciples didn't do it. So who did? There is an awesome prophecy found in the book of Daniel. God led Daniel down through time to the very end of time. And in more than one reference, God does that with him. But I want you to listen to two verses of scripture. And you write it down. Daniel 7 and verses 24 and 25. And there the Bible says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom 
are ten kings. Now let me pause. If you read the whole chapter, you will find God doing what he does also in the book of Revelation. He uses symbolic language. Why? God had to couch his specific word in symbols so that the heathen didn't know what the writers were talking about. If God hadn't done that, the church would have been extinguished back in Daniel's day and we never would have had these prophecies. So God used symbols and when prophecy points to a beast, it represents a king and his kingdom. And eventually when that kingdom that ruled the world was divided, there were 10 horns. And now I begin to read. And the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. When did that happen? First of all, we find that Babylon ruled the entire world from above 600 years before Christ. And after them came the Medes and the Persians. That would be Iraq and Iran of today. They ruled the entire world. They were ruling the world when Daniel went into the lion's den. And after that kingdom passed away, Greece under the powerful Alexanders ruled the entire world. And then after Greece came the Caesars, Julius and Augustus and the others ruled the entire world. And Rome was ruling the world when Jesus was born. And it was a Roman governor that sentenced him to death. Roman soldiers guarded his grave. But dissipation and, and immorality corrupted Rome. And the great historians record that in 476 AD, the strongest of the kingdoms fell. And Rome did not fall because of outside armies. Rome fell because of internal corruption. And just for you, Edward Gibbon says, and he's the one who wrote the fall of the Roman Empire. Edward Gibbon says that the men in Rome had so much leisure and so many servants that they weakened and became feminine, affecting feminine clothes, dress, and feminine hairdos. They became a nation of sodomites, gay, if you please. Look out, America, when we become so permissive of this perversion and sin. And when the pagans rode out of the Caucasus Mountains and out of Europe and began to sack Rome, it was easy because Rome had lost her virility. And finally the great empire was split up. Never again would any nation rule the whole world. And there were ten kingdoms represented by ten horns of this image. And the ten kingdoms are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall arise after them and shall be diverse, that means different, from the first and he shall subdue three kings. It's a matter of history. Another power would arise over there in Europe. Another power would arise after the division of Roman Empire. And this power, political, yes, but would be different than all the others. What made him different? He not only would be a political king in power, but a spiritual king also. He not only would control the bodies of men, but pretend to control the souls of men. And this power would execute religious law, and this power would go on to control virtually the entire earth. That's verse 24. Let me read verse 25. And he, this new power, shall speak great words against the Most High. Are you listening? Now, beloved, in kindness to you, I have chosen only a few references to show you tonight. I've got dozens from history. And he, this new power, that would be different than the others. And he, shall speak great words against the Most High. John the Revelator saw the same power arise and wrote of it in Revelation chapter 13. You ought to read it. And that chapter goes on to say that eventually an image to the beast would be formed and whoever received his mark in his forehead or in his hand would be destroyed. John corroborating what Daniel prophesied. I'm going to read it. I want you to get it. Verse 25. And he shall speak great words 
against the Most High. And number two, shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And number three, and think to change times and laws. This figure is pinpointed in history hundreds of years before the fact. Are you listening? And God said there would be three distinguishing identifying things. Number one, he would speak great words against God. John said he would speak blasphemy. There is a definition of blasphemy found in scripture. Christ was accused of blasphemy because he said he was the son of God. And the people said, how can this man call himself the son of God? How can this man say he can forgive sins? That's blasphemy. And even though Jesus was telling the truth, it gives us a definition of blasphemy. It is when man assumes the prerogatives of God and the reverence due God and the honor and worship that only God should receive. When a man takes that to himself, that's blasphemy. If you understand, say amen. amen. John said this power would open his mouth in blasphemy. Daniel said he would speak great words against the Most High. That's number one. Number two, he would wear out the saints of the Most High. Not only that, but John the Revelator said anybody that didn't go along would be killed by the church. And number three, would think to change God's law, times and laws. Having made that point, let's go to the screen. I want you to see what I brought for you to see tonight. Please bring the lights down. And my projectionist is ready. And I want you to see. And as I have already said, I could give this proof all night long. And you can go to your library and read it. Are we ready to go? The sun. The sun is perhaps the most ancient of all idols in worship. Men have worshiped the sun from almost time immemorial. They believe that life emanates from the sun. I know one thing, we couldn't have life without it. If the sun should be shut out, the earth would become cold, a complete ice cap. If the sun could be shut out, all vegetation would die. And soon after that, all animal life would die. Please dim these lights so my people can see what we are showing. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever men are forced to worship, please hear me. Whenever men are forced to worship, you may automatically know that is a false worship. And something is happening in our country. Tele-evangelists and Newt Gingrich and others are trying for a constitutional convention so they can force prayer in school and can force men to be morally good. One tele-evangelist said the desecration of Sunday is responsible for the moral downfall of America. And Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report and USA Today in recent weeks have all said we are now about to face morality by force. And that's what God said would happen when the mark of the beast is formed. If you don't have it, you can't buy or sell. If you do get it, you'll be destroyed by the wrath of God. Morality by force. Whenever religion is forced, it's false. God doesn't force anybody. He said, I've set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. And Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my command. That's what he says explicitly. What he says implicitly is, if you don't love me, forget it. Forced religion. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did when he said, either you bow down and worship my idol or you go in the fiery furnace. Forced religion. That's what was done in Persia when they said to Daniel, you have got to stop praying or else you go in the lion's den. Forced religion is always paganistic. You cannot force a man into the kingdom of heaven. And God never approves of it. 
This represents Constantine. It's actually a coin bearing his image. Constantine was emperor in the fourth century AD. Jesus had said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell, that's Hades, the grave, and the gates of the grave shall not enclose my church. And Christians were killed by pagans for hundreds of years. Finally, there came a Roman Caesar determined to destroy and stamp out Christianity. And the church went through 10 desperate years where all you had to do was be thought a Christian and you were put to death. But I told you, you can't destroy faith with force. Gibbon said every time they killed one, 10 would join. Every time they put to death one, 10 would join. People fled from their homes and wherever they went, like little wildfires sprang up new churches. The gospel was preached and lived. You can't step out, Christ church. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. And then there came an emperor whose name was Constantine. And he sent his legions thundering through the empire, declaring amnesty for Christians. 313 AD. In 321, 321 AD, the first Sunday law ever known was passed by a pagan whose name was Constantine. His law was entitled Venerablis Deus Solus, the venerable or holy day of the S-U-N Son. By Constantine 321. Here is that law. Let all the judges and town people and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun, but let those who are situated in the country freely and at full liberty attend to the business of agriculture. That was from an edict of March 7, 321 AD. That's the first Sunday law known. Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Andrew, all of the disciples of Christ had been dead. It was done by a pagan. Two years later, he joined the church. I did college term papers on him. I went to libraries in North Carolina, in Alabama, and in Pennsylvania. And I didn't find a single authority that wrote about Constantine who believed his conversion was genuine. By this time, people were flooding into the church. The church was growing by leaps and bounds. And it began to appear that political power was now resting on the side of those influenced by the Christian faith. So Constantine pretended a conversion. He claims to have seen a blazing cross in the sky and he got a message from God. And he put that cross on the shields and armor of his own soldiers and he became a member of the church. And when the emperor joined, the doors went open and everything was dragged into the church. Are you listening? It's like the devil said, if you can't lick them, join them. When I was a youngster and I graduated from college, I was single. And everything I owned was in one suitcase and a big trunk. And finally, after a year by myself, I got married to a wonderful Christian lady. And we went to our first home. We moved in together and I brought my trunk. And in my truck, I had some clothes, I had some books, I even had some food, as bachelors are known to have. And when I came in with my wife, I brought my trunk. The devil says, if you can't lick them, join them. And when he moved in with the so-called bride of Christ, he brought his trunk, he brought his clothes, and his books, and his food and moved in with the church. Constantine affected his conversion in 323 AD. Now here are those awesome prophecies of Daniel 7. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Here is that new ruler of Daniel 7:25. When the emperor came in and people everywhere began to come. They weren't converted. They just joined and they brought their pagan festivals with them. Today, 
much of what's done in Christendom is simply baptized paganism. And people don't even know it. Some of it is innocuous and probably not harmful. But have you ever thought about Christmas? Surely, I enjoy Christmas. It's family reunion time for us. And we celebrate the birth of our Lord. And I sing those beautiful Christmas carols. I love that time of the year. But haven't you ever wondered what Santa Claus and trees and round balls on the tree have to do with the birth of Christ? Put a question in and I'll tell you. Easter? Tomorrow is Easter. And incidentally, Jesus died on the 14th day of Nisan, which is Passover day. And sometimes it falls precisely on the Christian Easter. Sometimes. And it's all right. But you notice most people are more interested in hats and clothes than they are in the resurrection of our Lord. But haven't you wondered, listen, haven't you wondered what a rabbit and an egg and a chicken has to do with the resurrection of Jesus? Paganism! And we don't even know why. Mardi Gras? It's a chance to have a big blow before Ash Wednesday when you got to start fasting through 40 days of Lent. Paganism! Nothing to do with the Word of God. Let me leave that or I'll keep you too long. But the Bible says that this power would do three things. He would, number one, speak great words against God. John said he would blaspheme God. Number two, he'd put to death God's saints. And number three, he'd think to change God's law. The first one, he will speak blasphemies. Now I want you to look at this. You know good and well we couldn't do this if it were not valid. I want you to look at this. Now we read these words. The supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires complete submission and obedience to the will of the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. Remember what blasphemy is. Now, look at this one. Pope Julius II, Fifth Lateran Council, 1512. Thou art the shepherd. Thou art the physician. Thou art the governor. Thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. Now, Catholics believe that. And God has tender mercy on Catholics who believe that until they hear the truth. So I'm not throwing any stones at anybody. Are you listening to me? But I do not believe that any man born of a woman and who can die is God. He may be called a holy father, but he's not mine. He is not God. He claims to be vicar. What is vicar? Substitute. Substitute of Christ on earth, vicar. Does Jesus have a victor? vicar? Yes. He said, uh, it's expedient that I go away, but if I go, uh, I will send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth. The Holy Ghost is his vicar and not man. Here's another. The Pope is called the most holy because he is rightfully presumed to be such. The Pope alone is the vicar of Christ, who is the fountain, source, and fullness of all holiness. He shall speak great words. Now, I could put him up there for an hour, but I will not. Number two, he will wear out the saints of the Most High. Beloved, there was a Pope who was called Pope John 23. And he was loved by people all over the world. And he made a statement once, and I have it in my files. He said, our church has done things in the past of which we are justifiably ashamed. He was a scholar, he knew. Christians were lined up and fed to lions, burned at stake by the church. 
by the millions during the dark ages. And by the way, the dark ages were brought on by the church. That should have been the light set on a hill. How did they become the, 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 the authors of the dark ages? By taking away the word of God. The Bible says thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. You take away God's word, if it could be expunged from the earth, the earth would be plunged into another dark age. And during the dark ages, not a single invention worth talking about came into being. The industrial revolution, the renaissance, and the reformation all came after. The power of the Roman church was broken. It's just history. I'm reporting it as it is. They were slain and 50 millions died. They were given choices. You may recant or deny your faith. And many preferred to die rather than give up their faith. And they died by the millions. You ever hear of the Waldensians? A few years ago, we went to Peter Waldo's church in Torre Palice, Italy. A little church up in the mountains where this great leader preached the truth. They all loved the church, but the church had gone astray. And they were trying to hold to the truth. And the church sent men up there to destroy Peter Waldo and his followers. And they escaped into the caves and into the mountains. And finally, the men cut down trees and dropped them into the valley and created an inferno. And the flames and the smoke cut off the atmosphere. And these people were slaughtered in the Alps of Italy. And now I'm in the church and there's a group of us. And I sat in Peter Waldo's humble bench and I stood at his pulpit and I opened my mouth and declared the truth of God. And we joined hands. And I want to tell you, when we got through singing that day, a mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. There wasn't a dry eye in the church. Read it in your library. Heretics have no rights. They can be tortured without scruple. Like traitors to the state, heretics have put themselves outside the mercy of the law. They must be put to death, said the church. Who was a heretic? Anybody who disagreed with Roman dogma and defied the Roman vision. And not only that, a heretic was excommunicated, that means put out of the church, and subject to anathema, which meant he couldn't go to heaven, according to the church. A man could kill another man and get the last rites before they put him to death. But a heretic could not be saved, according to the church. And they said they deserved to die. And die they did. Dominican friar Thomas 1483 said, it is said of him, his victims numbered over 114,000, of whom 10,220 were burned. Many others were sentenced to life imprisonment. The church did it. The church did it. One day, the bishop from New York defied Eleanor Roosevelt as he tried to persuade FDR to sign a legislation. And he accused Eleanor of being a bigot. And Eleanor said, you have some nerve accusing me of that. It was your church that didn't allow men and women to worship God as they please, that put to death millions. And the bishop withdrew. It is a matter of history. Read it in your library. In the last most savage persecution under Emperor Diocletian, about 2,000 Christians perished worldwide. That's the fellow who tried to step out the church in 10 years. Now look, in the last most savage, I did that. In the first incident of Pope Innocent's crusade, 10 times that number of people were slaughtered. Now the pagans killed 2,000 under Diocletian, but under the church, 10 times that number were slaughtered. It is a record of history, and it went on for over 1,200 years. It went on. Finally, Martin Luther, now, there were other reformers, of course, Jerome, Savannarola, Huss, all of these men, some of them died long before Luther got started, burned at stake, ashes scattered on the Rhine River. But finally, God raised up the intrepid Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, 
Martin Luther was trying to find peace for his soul. He beat himself till his back ran blood, trying to find a way to atone for his sins. And finally, he was sent to Rome told to go down there and to get acquainted with the relics and all of the things that happened in Rome until he could find peace. And he went down there and he went to a church. I've been to that church more than once. And they have the Stella Sanctus, the holy staircase. They claim that Helen brought these back. The mother of Constantine brought these steps back from that area. And these were the steps that Jesus went up and down during his trial. And there were places where he's supposed to have fallen. And today, the Roman Catholic faithful climb on hands and knees. And when they come to the place where Jesus is supposed to have fallen, they pause and they kiss the step. And they're sincere. Luther was down there climbing those steps on his knees when he said it was a voice from heaven that cried out to him and said, Luther, get up from there. The just shall live by faith. You can't climb enough stairs to get remission for your sins. It's free. You don't have to do anything but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Luther then had a change of life. He began to write down his disagreements with the church. He had 95 of them. He nailed them to the church door at Wittenberg. And from that day on, he was despised. Eventually, he was brought to Worms. And there, he would face the most fertile mind in Romanism, the learned Dr. John Eck, in a debate before the prince of Germany. And Luther and his cohorts cut John Eck to shreds with their knowledge of the scripture. I read somewhere that when Luther didn't know the answer, Philip Melanchthon slipped him a note. Karlstadt was there and they won the day. And finally, Charles V told Luther to recant. He said, I need time. And he went into a room to pray. And this is that line that you've heard always associated with Martin Luther. He went into a room to pray. And the uh, biographer said he didn't even bow his head, but he looked up toward heaven. And he said, Lord, I'm but a child. Oh, I love this. Before John Eck, he was a consummate terror. But before God, a child. Just a child, not knowing how to go out or to come in. He was quoting Solomon. And by the time he got through praying, God had fixed him. He came out before Charles again, and he said, Dr. Luther, do you recant? Luther said, for a man to turn his back on his convictions and what he knows to be true is neither safe nor wise. I cannot and I will not recant. He dismissed him, but an order went out for him to be excommunicated and subject to anathema. And from that day forward, Luther's life wasn't worth a dime. He was ordered killed on sight. Anybody helping him would also be subject to papal anathema and excommunication. But there was a man standing there at the trial, Duke Frederick of Saxony. He had his men kidnap Luther, took him out in the woods and put him in a palace. Luther thought he was going to die. But instead of dying, he got the best food and the best care. And Luther began to realize that God was with him. It was out there that he wrote, a mighty fortress is our God. And that isn't all that he wrote. He decided to use his time wisely. He took the Latin Bible that nobody could understand except those trained in the university. And he translated it back into the language of the common people. And when Luther got his Bible ready, John Gutenberg had a printing press ready. And as the word of God began to be spread, light was returning. The dark ages were on their way out. And the truth of God began to have the ascendancy. I've just given you a little lesson in church history. 2,000 Protestants died within 50 years in the Netherlands. Three to 4,000 French Huguenots died in the massacre of St. Bartholomew, August 23, 1572. I'm fascinated by timepieces. I was out in Walla Walla, Washington. Somebody heard that and carried me to a store where they have ancient clocks, grandfather style. When I walked in, they told the man who I was and what I liked, and he took a special interest in me, and he unlocked the door. He said, Pastor, I'm going to show you something I only show to dealers. And when we went out of that first room that was utterly fascinating, into the second room, it was full of antique clocks, some of them dating back to these years. And he said to me, all of these clocks were made in France. And the Huguenots were the master clocksmiths. And I said to myself, 
why then did Switzerland become the time capital of the world? Even today, they tell you you got a Swiss movement. And I got on a plane, this is providential, it's the truth. I got on a plane flying home, and they have, you know, there's magazines in the airplane, and they had an article on how Switzerland became the time capital. During papal persecution, they were killing these Huguenots so fast because they wouldn't go along with papal dogma that many of them fled over into Geneva, which was a neutral country, and settled there and brought their trade with them, even looking at watches and clocks. We learned the truth. Some sources estimate that at least 50 million lives were destroyed during the Dark Ages. That's what dear Pope John 23rd was talking about and the relics are still around when you cross the Victor Hugo bridge into the Vatican there is the Casa D'Angelo the house of angels a torture chamber of years gone by number three they would speak great words they would wear out the saints and number three Think to change times and laws. Now I must watch my time. Ladies and gentlemen, follow me. Question. This is from a catechism. I have a copy of it. Question. Which day is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Now I am assuming that whoever said to me in a question tonight, we're obeying the new covenant, I'm just assuming you haven't read it and thought it through. Now, you have no excuse. All of this stuff about why in honor of the resurrection, that's foolishness. I'm gonna show you why. And you can go to your library and read it. Question, which day is the Sabbath? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That's from Reverend Peter Gehrman, the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. I have a copy in my library. And they don't mind me telling you this. They believe the church has the right to change God's law. So what did they do? They kept number one and number two, and they moved out the one that says, thou shalt not bow down to idols. And they made the fourth the third. And in order to make it up, they split the last one in two, and they still have 10. They thought to change times and laws. The church of God has thought it well to transfer the celebration and observance of Sabbath to Sunday. That's from 1958 Catechism of the Council of Trent for parish priests. They don't deny it. They don't care if you know. They're not offended with me telling you this. In fact, if you go to a learned priest, ask him, who changed the Sabbath? He'll tell you. He doesn't mind you knowing. Protestants ought to be ashamed of themselves. Catholics at least have an excuse. The Catholic Church, for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Protestant says, how can I receive the teachings of an apostate church? How, we ask, have you managed to receive her teachings all your life in direct opposition to your recognized teacher of the Bible on the Sabbath question? And that's from the Christian Sabbath, 1893, a Catholic document. They don't mind you knowing. Here's the truth about a wonderful lie. It is easier, said Jesus, for heaven and earth. I want you to read that with me. What does it say? A tittle, see it was written in Greek and Hebrew, and a tittle is like the crossing of a T. Jesus said, you can't even change a letter in the law. Easier for you to cause heaven and earth to disappear. Jesus said that. Why is it so hard for us to understand? That's what is an enigma to me. When it is finally clear, why is it so hard? Jesus said, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. 
I didn't come to do that. I came to show you how to keep it. And as his custom was, he went to church on the Sabbath. Jesus said, if ye love me, keep. Wait, 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 wait. There is a pronoun there. It is a possessive pronoun. If you love me, keep my, meaning he has his own commandments, opposed to those of men. If you love me, now if you love somebody else, do that. He gives you a choice. You're not forced. But if you love me, keep my commandments. Matthew 15 and verse 9. Matthew 15 and verse 9. The Decalogue, the moral law of God, was written by God with his own finger. No man wrote it. God wrote it on two tables of stone. And the Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of how much? Oh. Now, folks, that's the Bible. That's not C.D. Brooks. That's not my church. That's the Bible. Huh? That's the Word of God. And God means what He says. And He said, now, if you keep it all and break one, you're guilty of all. Because to break it is to sin, and the wages of sin is death. Now, when you didn't know any better, Acts 17, 30 says, God winked at him. But now, commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why now? Because now you know. Now you've heard. And I'm sending it to you, not because I'm angry with you, but because I love you. I want to bring you out of darkness, away from excuses, into marvelous light. And if you know and don't do it, You're guilty of all. And so, ladies and gentlemen, popes, priests, clergy, politicians, all say, keep Sunday. I'm going to read it again. Popes, priests, clergy, politicians, all say, keep Sunday. But, ladies and gentlemen, Adam, Abraham, the prophets, Jesus, and the disciples all say, keep the Sabbath. I cast my lot with Jesus. Now don't just say it, but if you mean it, I want you to say amen like you mean it. Might not have known it before, and believe me, there was a time I didn't know it. My family has a Methodist background. My granddaddy was a Methodist preacher. My uncle was a Methodist bishop. The other one was a Methodist professor. My brother-in-law was a Methodist preacher. Good people, love them to death. This isn't a contest between denominations. You don't even hear me mention my church name. Oh, I'm proud of it. One of the fastest growing churches in the world, but you don't hear me talking that. I don't teach denominationalism. I teach the word of God. If you appreciate it, say amen. amen. What you have seen tonight comes from the word of God with history confirming it. Amen. It's not mine. It's not my churches. It is the word of God. Jesus and his followers say, keep the Sabbath. If you love me. Keep, well, why is the Sabbath important? He said in Isaiah 58, 13, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, walking on my Sabbath, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasures on my, 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 on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing thine own ways nor finding thine own pleasure then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord those are the words of God Isaiah 58 13 and 14 he said stop trampling on my Sabbath doing your own ways and finding your own pleasure and call the Sabbath a delight the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him Sabbath honors him a few years back we almost got a universal holiday to honor dr martin luther king 
the state of Arizona Amen. said no. Amen. And I got upset with Arizona. I got upset. Well, why was a day important to honor somebody? Forget Martin Luther King. The Sabbath honors Jesus. It memorializes creation. It celebrates his deity. It recognizes his Godhood. And it's a day to worship with him. That's what it is. And he said it's important. It's not just another day. Oh, no, 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 no. And you don't keep Sabbath the way folk keep Sunday. Amen. You don't go to watch the Arizona Cardinals on the Sabbath. Amen. You don't mow the lawn. You don't play tennis on the Sabbath. Amen. It is a day to honor him, to spend in his presence, to be with family, to walk in the park, to see the things that God has made up close. To pick a flower and show it to your child and say, God made this. Look at the intricacy. Look at the delicateness. Look at the color. God did that. It didn't evolve. God did it. And your children will grow up noble. The Sabbath honors Jesus. And he said so. Now on the other hand, the Bible says, he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a what? And the truth is not what? Not only that, but Jesus died because he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. And ladies and gentlemen, that death bought salvation for those who love him. And he said, if you love me, do what? Now, tonight's message has been very, very frank. I wouldn't be honest if I tried to cover this up. There's some who never knew, as once my family didn't know. The end is near. Jesus said in Revelation 22, last book, last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, Jesus said, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Jesus, in these last days, while the world is going morally mad, is trying to get his people ready that they will have a right to enter in to the city of God and eat from the tree of life. Jesus means business. And he sends his truth in love. In love. And if I haven't conveyed it in love, I sincerely ask God to forgive me. I pray many times, Lord, don't let the rough edges of my own personality offend anybody. Now, if the truth offends, I can't help that. I must tell the truth. But I do it with a burning heart. I do it loving the people who come to hear. I do it understanding those who never knew because I was there. My family was there. It's unusual. It's new, it's straight, but it's the truth. I said it's the truth. Amen. If I haven't told you the truth, then I'd be damned. Amen. I have told you the truth. Amen. Do you love the truth? Amen. Do you want the truth inside of you? Amen. And even if you struggle, do you want the truth to overcome error in your heart? Yes. Do you love Jesus who calls himself the truth? Do you love him enough to obey him and not man? Amen. Then if you do, I want you to stand and let us close with prayer. Oh, my father, this is not an easy message for your people. But you sent it because you love them so. And tonight in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would take this truth that is so different and apply it gently to the delicate hearts of those whom you love and help the people to understand that you love them, that Brooks loves them. Help them to understand it is because of love 
that you're speaking to hearts right now in this auditorium. And may men and women and boys and girls decide now I'm going to walk with Jesus and not with man. There is no man who can save us. There is no purgatory of a second chance. It's heaven or hell. And you are the only one that can save us. And I beg you to do it tonight in the name of Jesus. There is someone who cares when his holy name's abused. There is someone who cares when his word gets all confused. There is someone who cares when his commandments are misused. That someone who cares is Jesus. There is someone who cares. The Sabbath is his day. There is someone who cares. And he is the living way. There is someone who cares about you. In love and truth obey. For that someone who cares is Jesus. And now may he bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace.